Have you ever seen the sea on fire? I don't mean a surface fire. I mean a boiling, raging torment of fire from the bowels of the earth. This is a case study of the Petrel One well and what happens when well control goes catastrophically wrong. You will witness the sea on fire from footage never seen before. My name is Brian Atchison. I have spent my entire career involved with well operations, managing the risk of well control. This film and story is more than professional, it's personal, because my father was a pioneer in this industry. He was a mechanic on the Sedco 135G, an eyewitness and an active player in the blowout, its recovery and the following tragedy. The information on this video is taken from family pictures, home movies, an eyewitness account, and the report of the Commonwealth of Australia Department of National Development, Bureau of Mineral Resources, Geology and Geophysics. In 1969, the Atlantic Richfield Company had contracted the Sedco 135G to drill for oil off the coast of the Northern Territories of Australia in the Bonaparte Gulf. The 135G was a first generation offshore drilling rig, designed, built and owned by the South Eastern Drilling Company, Sedco. The triangular deck shape and milk bottle shaped legs make the rig instantly recognisable. Situated on the deck were the living and office accommodations, power generation system, deck cranes, substructure, derrick and the equipment required for rotary drilling operations. The rig equipment list had all the subsea equipment required for marine drilling operations, including one annular preventer and three ram type preventers, all rated to 5000 psi. Sedco was one of the pioneers of the technology for marine drilling operations. The company mobilised a crew who were resident in Darwin in the Northern Territories. Operations were going well, with new crews learning to use the new technology whilst drilling the Petrel One well for the client. On the 6th of August 1969, the rig was drilling 8 and 3 8 inch hole around 13,000 feet with 10.5 pound per gallon density drilling mud. Then this happened. The events leading up to the blowout consisted of an increase in drilling rate for 5 feet at 13,052 feet. The drilling process was stopped and the well was observed to be flowing without pumping from surface. The annular preventer was closed 5 minutes after the initial drilling rate increase to prevent any further influx from the formation into the well bore. The shut-in drill pipe pressure was 750 psi. The shut-in casing pressure was 1,800 psi. The influx or kick volume was 190 barrels. I am a petroleum engineer with significant experience in the review and analysis of well control incidents. The pressures in this incident are high. The global average for influx volumes is 25 barrels. The excessive influx volume associated with this incident is very likely a function of poor drilling and well control practices, which are typically rooted in human factors issues. There was obviously a very heavy reliance on human behaviours and competency, which in this instance failed, resulting in an extremely large influx. The size of the influx is very important, because the smaller the influx, the smaller the resulting well kill pressures experienced by the equipment. In all well control training we stress to minimise the volume of the influx, we will hear later why, in this case, the results were catastrophic. After the well was shut in on the 5000 psi annular, the team followed the operator's procedure to make the situation safe. This involved pumping heavier fluid into the well. This was to be done whilst periodically moving the drill pipe with the well closed in on the large rubber annular. During this process, the annular failed which led ultimately to a complete loss of control of the well. The annular failed whilst the pipe was being moved by the driller. 
A violent discharge of mud occurred at the drill floor, knocking the driller off the brake handle. The lack of protection for the driller and proximity to the point of mud discharge meant the draw works were now out of control. The blocks were dropped and the drilling line parted at the draw works drum. Control of movement of the drill pipe was no longer possible. Both sets of pipe rams were closed and the upper pipe ram sealed. The BOP was unlikely to remain sealed because the drill pipe was moving relative to the BOP rams which it is not designed for. The situation was critical. However, there was still a circulation path. As a result, heavy mud was continued to be pumped into the well. The annular pressure increased to an extent that eventually the rams lost pressure integrity and gas was flowing from the well up the riser pipe to the rig. In a final attempt to control the well, pumping of cement down the well started and continued for a number of hours. The flow from the well increased to a point where it was clear well control had been lost and the safety of the vessel took priority. The rig's anchor winches were used to move the vessel away from the well, with the marine riser still connected to the BOP and well. The blind rams were shut, however with drill pipe across them they would not seal the well. As a result, gas had a path to the rig floor through the BOP's riser pipe and then onto the rig floor. When the riser pipe connected to the BOP started to clash with the rig substructure, there was a failed attempt to disconnect the subsea equipment. Gas was flowing from the well through the riser to the drill floor. All personnel were evacuated from the rig. Fires fueled by the well gas broke out on the rig floor, under the rig floor and in the office and accommodation block. As the rig continued to winch off location, the riser connected to the BOP parted just above the BOP, which meant the gas-fed fire on the rig would cease. Several secondary fires were still in place. Simultaneously, a gas plume from the seabed appeared in the water near the rig. The gas plume was subsequently ignited to ensure the gas plume and fire was recognisable to shipping. When the rig was a safe distance from the gas plume, the rig crew mobilised back onto the Sedco 135G to put the fires out and address another critical vessel stability issue caused by the fire. With the fires extinguished and the rig stable, a damage assessment was conducted. Crew quarters and barge control room completely gutted. Derrick A-frame warped. All drill floor and derrick equipment badly damaged. All subsea equipment on the seabed. Amazingly, there were no reported fatalities or injuries throughout this phase of the operation. At this point, the rig was towed off location. The BOPs were sitting on the wellhead. A violent flow of hydrocarbon gas was flowing from the top of the BOP, forming a gas plume which was then auto-igniting near the surface of the water. No oil slick was observed. Following a detailed review of the situation with the regulator, operator and drilling contractor, the quickest solution was to repair the rig in a shipyard, return it to location and drill a relief well. The relief well was started on the 6th of February 1970 and was expected to conclude in May 1970. As a result, the sea was boiling from the discharge of the Petrol 1 well for around 10 months. We can see from this home movie footage the seemingly supernatural image of the sea on fire. Tragically, whilst drilling the relief well, a marine accident resulted in the loss of nine personnel. The Sedco Helen workboat caught an anchor buoy in her propeller. The buoy impacted below the waterline of the hull, quickly flooding and sinking the vessel. 
The official report into this incident made several recommendations which have been adopted by the industry. Keep the drill pipe stationary during well control operations. Provide equipment to shear the drill pipe in the BOP. Provide two annular preventers in subsea BOPs. Maintain annular preventer elements. Provide a drill pipe drop-in check valve. Provide a method to accurately measure return flow from the well. A modern review of this incident, with the limited information available, highlights more issues. There was an unreasonable exposure to human factors issues. Early well engineering standards and operational procedures fall far short of modern standards. The most striking of which is using BOP equipment rated to 5,000 PSI in a well that can produce pressures greater than 5,000 PSI. Whilst well engineering standards, procedures and rig designs have improved dramatically in the ensuing 50 years, one aspect of well construction is the same. The recognition of an influx, decision making, equipment control and closing the BOP is still down to one man, the driller. Blowouts are still happening on a regular basis, with a subsequent exposure to lives and the environment. The more notable recent events are, in 2010, Deepwater Horizon with 11 fatalities, 2018, Prior Trust with 5 fatalities, and there are several more. They are predominantly caused by human factors issues, just like on the Sedco 135G on the Petrel 1 well over 50 years ago. Fortunately, a recent innovation is providing a tool to protect the driller, personnel, the environment, assets, reputation and against financial loss. Automated well control is a tool for the driller that automatically makes the well safe. The well construction industry owes a tremendous debt of gratitude to its pioneers. Their courage, innovation and energetic enthusiasm paved the way for cheap, reliable energy for the world to benefit from. It may have taken over 50 years, but we finally have a solution for the constant industry threat of well control.